During the period 20 to 25 June, these films were made of the activities of the 1st Brigade of the 101st Airborne Division in Kantum Province. As the 18-day-long Operation Hawthorne neared its end, aviation support elements undertook civic action missions. Food and clothing are delivered to friendly Montagnard settlements. Using helicopters for the MAG-V sponsored project, remote villages of the mountain tribesmen are visited by American and Vietnamese representatives. Sometimes called Rade, these mountain dwellers build unique and picturesque villages. Finally, the chopper arrives and slowly settles to a landing. The civic action team gets out and the donated clothing and other supplies are removed from the helicopter. The mountain yards gather from all over the settlement for the distribution of the food and clothing. For most of these primitive people, it is the first time they have ever worn the garments of Western men. The tribal chief's new coveralls delight him, and he helps distribute the other articles amongst his people. But the mission of this team does not end with gifts of food and clothing. A medical aid group begins treatment for those who are in need of attention. The children are taken first. Here in the remote mountain communities, there is no professional medical care available. And these people look forward eagerly to the visits of the American medics and their Vietnamese assistants. In a performance rarely seen by outsiders, girls of the village do a traditional folk dance to entertain and thank their visiting American friends. Oriental gongs of several sizes and a variety of tones are used to set the rhythm for the dance. From earliest childhood, these tribal daughters are taught the ancient dances. At Dock Toe on the 23rd of June, a victory celebration is held for the 101st. A memorial honoring those who have fallen in battle is flanked by an honor guard of Arvin troops. Brigade Commander Brigadier General Willard Pearson and the commanding officer of the Arvin 41st Regiment lay wreaths at the monument. The ceremonies are hosted by the Arvin Regiment and the people of Dock Toe. The memorial ceremonies conclude with a Vietnamese bugler blowing taps. Following the ceremonies at the monument, General Pearson and his host go to inspect the display of captured VC equipment being exhibited in the center of town. The enemy's automatic weapons are of particular interest to these Arvin soldiers. In a gesture symbolizing the appreciation of the people of Dock To, for Operation Hawthorne, a selected group of airborne troopers are presented with flower garlands. Then, outside of town, the battle-weary veterans of Operation Hawthorne come marching in from the hills of Kantum province. Their colors fly proudly as they move wordlessly toward their bivouac area nearby. As the dusty troopers pass General Pearson and his staff, their commander salutes them. In 18 days of rugged mountain and jungle fighting north of Dock Toe, these tough combat veterans met and defeated the enemy in repeated heavy contact. Enemy losses were reported at 570 killed in action, 22 captured. Pretty girls come out to offer the returning men a cooling drink. And still they come, returning to the brigade's forward base. At the bivouac area, the men sit in front of their tents and rest. Some check over equipment. 
Operation Hawthorne is over, and only small chores occupy their attention. Suddenly, the word is passed. Movie actor John Wayne is here. Big John Wayne meets eye to eye with Captain William F. Carpenter, outstanding soldier and former Army football star. For the Screaming Eagles, the visit of Hollywood's heroic John Wayne is an exciting event which not even a driving rain is able to spoil. But their guest must soon depart and boards his helicopter. On the following day, General Pearson addresses the troops. He congratulates them for a job well done and briefs them on the next operation. Afterwards, unit commanders go over details. The new operation will be known as Operation Eagle Bait and involves both troopers of the 101st and Vietnamese irregulars. In their camouflage outfits, the troopers receive last-minute instructions. For some, there are lingering thoughts of experiences on previous operations. Then the time for thinking is over, and the combined troops move to the nearby Docto airstrip and prepare for airlift into enemy control territory. The Viet Cong are to be given no time for recovery from the impact of Operation Hawthorne. The Pleiku Flight Operations Center provides important air traffic control for the strategic Central Highlands region of South Vietnam. The center is located at the U.S. Army Airfield, Camp Holloway. Its assignment? To monitor all Army flights, including reconnaissance, air supply, and troop carrying missions. Inside the flight operations van, radio communications connect aircraft with the airfield control elements. The coordination control section of the van is equipped with facilities for following flight patterns. Flight data is recorded on plotting boards which chart the location of aircraft in the area. Tower personnel observe traffic coming through the field and log all flights. Wind direction and other flight information is relayed to aircraft for aid in takeoff and landing. Teletype equipment in the van sends vital flight information to other air control stations and to control headquarters at Tonsonwood Air Base. The Camp Holloway Tower provides 24-hour-a-day traffic control and handles hundreds of Army flights daily, including rotary and fixed-wing aircraft. On 25 June at Cameron Bay, a company of Army engineers is assigned to construction and repair of pier facilities. Divers trained at Army and Navy diving schools prepare for the operation. This unit is equipped for all types of underwater construction. The gear worn by the divers is for use in shallow water. Air hoses to the divers are fed from large tanks which are laid out on the pier. The cross beams on this fuel jetty have rotted through and new beams have to be installed. Divers from the unit have recently completed LST docking facilities and helped build an underwater retaining wall at a DeLong pier site.
construction of the United States Army Worldwide Communications Facilities continued to move forward in May and June in Southeast Asia. On the northeast coast at Da Nang, Vietnamese women dig foundation trenches for the integrated wideband communication system installation. This system, which primarily utilizes tropospheric scatter for radio wave propagation, provides consistent signals over long distances. Philippine workers also are employed on the job, here seen connecting power cables to a power generator van and aligning a reflector disc. Farther south at Natrong is another IWCS site. Antenna locations are surveyed accurately to aim the giant dishes toward other relay stations along the route. Tons of steel I-beams are unloaded for use in the construction. Wooden forms are erected for foundations of microwave antennas. Play Coup is another link in the communications network. Steel rods are assembled in sections to use in reinforcing the concrete structures. Here is a portion of the concrete base for a 120-foot antenna. A guard tower is being built for use in providing security for the installation. At the site at Phu Lam, fuel tanks are being readied for operation. These large tanks will hold the fuel necessary to operate the generators which will supply electric power to the system. At Vung Tau, where considerable progress has already been made, large quantities of steel await assembly at the communication site. This excavation is for the emplacement of an MRC-85 signal van. When these facilities are completed, United States military forces will be assured of dependable communications in the area. Before dawn on 28 June, a convoy moves out of Camp Coleman near Santo Domingo in the Dominican Republic. After seven months as a part of the Inter-American Police Force, the 320th Artillery, 82nd Airborne Division is going home. En route to Red Beach, its embarkation point, the convoy crosses the Duarte Bridge, which the rebels had barricaded during the height of the fighting. It passes shell-riddled buildings, mute reminders of the battles which had raged here only months ago. Then, a wait at the ocean's edge. On schedule, an LST, the Waldo County, arrives to take on this contingent of the 320th for return to Sunny Point, North Carolina. Other elements of the unit are returning by air. With the election of Juan Belaguer as President of the Dominican Republic, the Organization of American States has voted to disband the Inter-American Police Force. The 320th is the first unit to leave. The boarding begins. Each freshly painted vehicle moves into line in a carefully coordinated sequence, then is directed to its position within the LST. When the equipment is aboard, the troops move on to the ship and up to the deck where they take places along the rail. As the LST prepares to leave, the men are thanked for their service by Brazilian General Alvaro Braja, Commander-in-Chief of the Inter-American Police Force. Then, the Waldo County gets underway on the four-day trip back home. While the first convoy is moving out to sea, 
Another section of the 320th arrives at San Isidro Airport. In brief ceremonies, Brigadier General Robert Linville, Commanding General, U.S. Forces, Dominican Republic, commends the troops. Then the men move to their waiting C-130s. Farewells are said as the planes are boarded. Equipment and luggage are loaded. For the 320th Airborne Artillery, it's goodbye, Dominican Republic. Hello, home. On 27 June, in Bonpong, Thailand, the Thai Prime Minister inspects an honor guard. The occasion is the dedication of a new processing plant built by the Preserved Food Organization. Among those greeting the Prime Minister is the senior U.S. Army logistical advisor to the Royal Thai Army, Colonel Thomas G. Frost. A Buddhist altar has been set up on the grounds, and the Prime Minister opens the ceremonies by lighting a candle and briefly praying for the success of the new factory. It will turn out preserved foods for the Royal Thai Armed Forces, police, and other government agencies. The director of the Processed Food Organization introduces the Prime Minister, who briefly addresses the audience of Thai government officials and members of the diplomatic corps. Then, as balloons soar skyward to celebrate the occasion, the plant is dedicated, and the Prime Minister begins a tour of the facility. This factory is fully equipped, and a modern installation in every respect. The United States government has followed its planning and construction closely. The plant will employ approximately 500 persons when full production capacity is achieved. It represents a significant addition to the Thai economic structure. Every year, the citizens of Edelbrook Luxembourg observe Remembrance Day to honor the memory of Lieutenant General George S. Patton, Jr. It was from this city that General Patton, commanding the United States Third Army, launched his counterattack in the Battle of the Bulge on December 16, 1944. June 25th, the day preceding Remembrance Day, begins with sports events, including skydiving by men of both the 8th Infantry Division and Supreme Headquarters, Allied Powers in Europe. Guests include Mrs. Patricia Roberts Harris, the U.S. Ambassador to Luxembourg, and Lieutenant General Theodore J. Conway, Commanding General of the 7th Army. Thousands of people come out in the rain to see the parade and the ceremonies. Troop units and military bands from seven nations parade down Avenue John F. Kennedy. Ambassador Harris here delivers a memorial address. Then Mrs. Harris and the mayor of Edelbrook, assisted by the mayor's two sons, lay wreaths at the base of the Patton Monument. 